Uh, I'm privileged uh, to have uh, an opportunity to introduce uh, a speaker who uh, uh, a number of us had the pleasure to meet approximately a year ago. Um, he comes from Boston area. Uh, one of the uh, inspiring new uh, leaders of, a, of the movement to uh, bring some progressive ideas and progressive values uh, to the country. And uh, it's a privilege to be able to have a young a person who's so engaged. Uh, Michael has uh, uh, worked tirelessly on the national scene to try to deal with some of the terrible uh, afflictions that our nation is wrestling with. Uh, and he puts his uh, money where his mouth is. He, uh, he's a teacher, uh, a very inspirational teacher. He's worked with all kinds of kids at all different kinds of levels. And on the side, he does all this political action stuff. So he really is a, a model for uh, what the next generation is, uh, is doing. So it's a privilege for me to present uh, Michael Ippolito and share his many experiences and ideas uh, for the next generation. Thanks, Michael, for being here. very much Wisconsin Grassroots Network, uh, Nate Tim and Bob Prigo for inviting me here to speak with all of you. I'd also like to thank Julie Prigo. Um, Bob and Julie are uh, hosting myself and Julie while we're here, as they did um, during the Democracy Convention in August 2013 when we all met. And more importantly, I'd like to thank all of you for being here and for the work that you do to help affect change in your local communities. That alone separates you from the folks who say, you know, I, I, got, I got my hands full with everything that I can do, you know, working, taking care of my families. I really, I don't have time. It's important that we all make time and create that space. And just by being here, each and every one of you is doing that. And that alone is, is, is commendable. And I just want to thank you all for everything that you do, not just being here. I know you're involved in lots of different local groups. So thank you, because you're the front line of the struggle. And Wisconsin really is a microcosm of what's going on nationally. So thank you. Thank you. Green Bay Packers Cup. <laughs> Convert me while I'm here. <laughs> so, um, just real quick before I get started, I just want to take a quick show of hands. About how many of you believe that in 2010, the Citizens United decision, how many people believe that, that is when corporations became defined as people? Just give me a show of hands, a quick show of hands. Okay, a handful of folks around the room? Okay, that's good. That's good that only a handful believe that. Um, so, tonight, or today, during this talk, there's a few things that I'm gonna be talking about. One, I'd like to give you a little perspective of how I got here, real briefly. And then talk about a movement strategy, which I am gonna use visual, visual evidence of. Right, right here. These um, spoons and this, uh, barbecue device are going to be my visuals to help communicate this. I've actually been going around a lot and giving this as dinner talks and I, I came up with this in January and it really has caught fire since this movement strategy. And uh, the backdrop of this movement strategy and all the work that I do comes from um, my work that I've done in climate science. After this I'll be giving a session called the global ecological collapse happening now and the way forward. I cannot impress upon everyone enough that we are already on borrowed time and the 
the science is just um, painting even a darker picture with each day. Um, if you'd like to learn more about that, that's, I'll be uh, holding a session right after this. Um, but if anyone says, wait, how do you know that that's true? Just to talk about that for a second. How do you know that that's true? Well, just to speak briefly to what's setting the clock. Um, physicists, that's my background in physics. Physicists can calculate exactly how much warming the planet is doing each day. Um, that amount of warming is, sounds small. It's um, 0.6 joules of energy per square meter. And so that's like, well, that's, what is that really, right? So over the area of the entire planet, that's extra warming, right? That equals the same amount of energy as 400,000 Hiroshima bombs going off every day that the planet is absorbing of energy. And that's extra energy it's absorbing because that energy would otherwise be released back into space if it were not for the greenhouse gases that humanity has put in there. And you could say, well, how do you know that? Well, for one, the upper atmosphere is not warming as fast. And for two, well, funny thing is that when you burn greenhouse gases, there's a different type of carbon isotope that, is, that you would see in nature. It's different than the one you would see in nature. So you can actually see and go, oh, there's more of that isotope. That's because of burning of fossil fuels. So when people try to make an attempt to say, well, that's not real, is it? You know, that's, we, it's natural. Or you might even hear people talk about the sun and the sun being responsible. Since 2000, for the last 15 years, we've been living during an era when the sun has had decreased solar activity. So all things being equal, if humanity's effect had not changed um, the conditions of the planet, we would actually be experiencing a period of cooling right now. So the sun is actually masking the problem. And you could say fortunately in some respects, um, it's looking like that the next solar cycle, and I'll get this in more detail during my session, but that the next solar cycle is going to be um, also in a decreased state of solar activity. Um, so we have a good 10 to 15 more years of decreased solar activity, but that doesn't mean that we're not already breaking records and further exacerbating the problem um, that we're facing. So that is what's really setting the clock. So with that, and with all the, the things that uh, Mike McCabe just shared, which is a great list, my work has always been focused on well, what do we need to do to advance things forward? Real briefly, my history went like this. Um, as a very little boy, I saw this uh, video, um, it was on PBS, and uh, it was a, of elephants getting poached, and they cut off their faces. And that's actually what, uh, for the tusks, and that's what really got me questioning insatiably for the rest of my life because of seeing the images, they cut off the faces, they were live elephants, they sedated them, and it was just horrific. And you saw them throwing the faces onto flatbed trucks. Interestingly, to point out that one of my tools here, apparently from the Krigo house, is from Bob's um, grandparents, and it appears to be ivory, which is rather interesting based upon my history, because if you notice, it has two prongs on it, and um, when I get to that, you'll understand why that has a strong imagery, because that's our offense. But let me get to that in just a moment. So I went on, I come from a blue collar family, the first to go to college, um, military family, and um, I just insatiably questioned and wanted to understand how I could help better serve this world and lend my energy to making things better, however I can. And um, that led me to a curious download in 2004, the fall of 2004, by a guy named Noam Chomsky. And uh, I was just Googling, uh, uh, pardon me, I wasn't Googling, Google wasn't even around then. Well, it was, but I wasn't using it, I didn't know of it yet. 
But um, it was a lime wire. Uh, I was looking at great speeches. And I was just, anything I could get my hands on. And it was this 90 second clip why elites hate democracy. And I listened to it and I, you know, I gotta know more about this guy. And so I started it down on everything I could and go on to listen to him for hours and hours and hours. Now it's been about 4,000 hours that I've listened to him, seriously. Um, and around that same time, I came across this documentary. It's called The Corporation. It's won 26 International Film Awards, Canada's most popular documentary. If you have not seen this, please make it a point to watch this because every American, every person on the planet should probably watch this video, okay? The Corporation, and you can watch it online for free. So, <clears throat> it's been over 10 years since the clarity uh, came to me of what I, uh, where I needed to focus my attention. And it was on corporate constitutional rights. And this idea that money became speech in 1976 with the Buckley versus Vallejo decision. So for those of you who raised your hand when we talked about corporations becoming people um, in 2010, I'd just like to lift up the fact that it was actually in 1886 that corporations um, began being considered persons under the Constitution in the Santa Clara or Southern Pacific Railroad case. And that's something that we cannot emphasize enough as people who are active and engaged in the movement. All around us, there is misinformation, and when people say we need to overturn Citizens United, and Mark, Mark Polk hand, God bless him, he was a great talk he gave today, and sounds like he's a very good representative for all of you, but he talked about overturning Citizens United. We have to change our vernacular. We cannot speak about that anymore. We have to talk about overturning corporate constitutional rights and the idea that money is speech. I'm gonna talk how we can do that. Um, but there are things all around us, like Jeff Clements wrote a book, and on the very top it said, the guidebook to overturning Citizens United. Robin Wright did a video, Inequality for All, and one hour and 13 minutes into it, he talks about how in 2010, the Supreme Court defined corporations as people. And all around us, there's misinformation about this. And I, you know, whether it's just they shortcut it or, you know, whatever it may be, um, it's really important to clarify that this did not start in 2010. It's a long struggle. And to that end, I'm part of a national action team with Move to Amend. And this May, we're going to be doing actions. It's a month of action <coughs> to celebrate, celebrate the 129th birthday of corporations. <laughs> you'll see more about that. Hopefully you'll see if anyone's a part of Move to Med and so forth, little videos and things like that to uh, go into like a Walmart singing happy birthday to corporations, you know, and then just a 30 second video with links that can help you learn more. One of the links would be links to legalize democracy. If you have not seen this yet, you can watch it on YouTube streaming. This gives uh, some excellent legal uh, timelines about the matter. And um, I definitely uh, think this is something that everyone should check out. And that's what we're trying to help do, get that information to go viral to the general public. It's a legalized democracy, and you can watch it on YouTube. Um, for, it's 29 minutes long, it's very good. Anyway, so, um, so nevertheless, so then I got involved at always trying to help uh, in you know, movie nights and you know, getting involved with the Occupy movement, still involved with Occupy and part of Inner Occupy. I know that's sometimes a word that makes people shudder, but we help serve the movement now uh, in lots of different ways. We have a call series right now going on. Um, it's the National Fast Track um, TPP call with Popular Resistance. If you're not familiar with Popular Resistance, popularresistance.org, check that out. Um, a few weeks ago we had Ralph Nader on, and if I have the time, hopefully I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the things he brought to the table on that call, because that's part of the movement strategy that I've been putting forward since January this year. And it's quite, has a, kind of caught on a bit across the nation, which is a good thing. Um, 
And so I've served in many different ways. I was the national coordinator this past year uh, during the People's Climate March. Just a quick show of hands. Anyone, if I say the People's Climate March in New York City, how, how many people know what that is? Oh, awesome. Excellent. Yeah, there were about 500,000 people, 400 and change, who shut down Manhattan for the day. And what's wild is when I go back to where I live just south of Boston, about 19 out of 20 people never heard that it happened. But, Thank you, media. Yeah, in the age of social media and what have you. But it's still important that it did happen and that people are coming together. But some, and additionally, I've been a member of the Global Climate Convergence since it began. I'm a national facilitator on those calls. And um, I've been to their conferences and what have you. And something that I've really, over the years, whether it's been involved in Move to Amend, the Global Climate Convergence, or other organizations and efforts I've been affiliated with, conferences and things like that. I've gotten to a point now where I say, events like these can no longer be liberal entertainment or progressive entertainment. That people, when they leave these, they really have to stay focused, stay active, and stay vigilant in their efforts. Because you know, just coming together and doing things to feel good is just not enough anymore. So, working in the global climate convergence realm and leading up to the People's Climate March, it's all coming together now, um, there was a conference before the march, the weekend before the march, and in that conference, um, there was Naomi Klein gave a talk, okay? It was uh, the intro talk to kind of set the table for everything. And... Um, <clears throat> In the closing, she said, about 2,000 people were there, and she said, this time we ask for action, next time we ask for everything, and everyone applauded. And people were there, and they were waiting for something, something to be said to focus on. You know, it's wonderful to have lists of things that make sense, but how do we get there? What is the strategic step forward that we all can focus on and get behind? I was quite critical of her saying that and was emailing lots of folks about that, including her publicist, and because um, her email is apparently not public. But anyway, I can get in touch with Professor Chomsky and do stuff with him, but I can't with Naomi Klein, interesting, I don't know. But anyway, um, and she came out and she made a video, I have no idea what impact I had on this, but she made a video um, supporting Move to Amend and the We the People Amendment um, shortly thereafter, it was a few weeks after the march, but that still could have had 2,000 people ready to go and do something specific. So <clears throat> with that, um, it leads me into this movement strategy here that I have by way of utensils. Because it's, a, it's really, um, there's three different arms to this movement strategy. And it's something that we have to all take on, each one, all at the same time. We have to do all of this, okay? And so this first one right here, the first spoon, this is encouraging each and every one of you to continue to do whatever it is you do. Okay, I understand that in what is a triple O, they're doing a lot of sand fracking, mm. right? So if, you, if that's what you're working on, keep on working on it, you know? And people like myself, I'm here to support you, working on tools constantly to help develop um, your ability to make an effect, an effect change. We have great resources within our Occupy for conference calls, so we can set you up with email lists and things <laughs> like that. If you're ever interested in that, or even a hub, website, whatever, we can look to help you out with that. Um, and there's other things in the pipeline. Uh, love the opportunity to come back here in maybe a year or so, or when they're done, and show you. Um, but for now, this is simply do what you're doing and keep on keeping on. The thing is, though, these things aren't game changers. Because say, for example, you take the strategy like CellDef and you pass local ordinances, and you say, we don't want, in triple o, uh, triple o, we don't want sand fracking here. Well, corporations with their constitutional rights, you know what they're going to do? They're going to overturn it at some level. Because you don't have those rights. But I'm not saying not to do it, because it's an organizing strategy. 
and it gets lots of people outraged because they wake up and realize what we're talking about. Something that you already know, but the regular folk, average person just working hard, trying to make a living, maybe in this area, taking care of a farm, busting you know, their butts each day, but they don't understand how it all kind of connects. And they're supporting people who are otherwise hurting them and their families. So keep on keeping on. This next spoon right here, this, this is our defense. Oh, uh, football fans in here? Packer fans? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Well, this is our defense right here. And what our defense is, is to stop toxic trade agreements like the TPP. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We cannot allow things like that to pass. Those are game changers, meaning they change the rules of the game because they change the rules in the legal system. And that's where the game is won and lost, in the legal system. Some interesting points I'd like to just mention, and I will give all the credit to Ralph Nieder because it was actually on a call with him just three weeks ago where we had over a couple hundred people on that call that uh, I learned some of these details about the TPP and what have you and the WTO. But that, uh, so it's for many years, for many decades, trade agreements between countries were exclusively about trade. Um, and these trade agreements were not enforceable until NAFTA and the WTO. Um, so, for example, now though, there are, there's a court in Geneva that if you have a grievance, a uh, country has a grievance, say the United States says, hey, we don't want child labor products, um, you know, in our country. And um, we want to go to the um, WTO to fight that. Well, that's an interesting thing because what goes to the WTO are not things that are these, like, child labor. It's actually the, what cases they hear about are the cases of treating workers too good, for example. That's a violation of the WTO. Okay? And NAFTA and these trade agreements have the status of federal law. They usurp the Constitution. They're game changers. Okay, it's, in, it's important to lift up that these trade agreements are not about free trade. Um, they are about supporting constitutional rights, worker rights, environmental rights, your health and safety, and subverting the economy. Calling these trade agreements is a mischaracterization, and in the words of Ralph Nader, it's better to be called a global corporate coup and do not use free trade. What he says, it's accurate I believe, corporate fascism 